Hey folks, this video has kindly been sponsored by the kind folks over at NordVPN. Hello again, users of the internet. Browsing without protection? Dangerous game to play with all your personal data and private information. But no need to fear, for NordVPN is here. The best virtual private network that you can get. An encrypted shield for your personal data and for peace of mind when browsing the internet. The lovely folks over at NordVPN have been kind enough to offer you all another special offer through my channel. Following the link below and on screen can lead you to an awesome discount on a two year plan with an additional month for free. Get the exclusive NordVPN deal here, nordvpn.com slash iRoll. It's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. I use NordVPN regularly and I've mentioned this several times on the channel and I just can't recommend it enough. Not only does it provide top tier protection as mentioned, but it also allows you to virtually be anywhere in the world. With this, you can gain access to region exclusive movies, TV shows, and even deals slash discounts going on in other regions. NordVPN is an incredible service and the best out there. And if you head on over to nordvpn.com slash Hyrule, you can get all of this and maybe even their bundle deal on offer. You'll find out more about that over on their website. Go and check it out, and now, on to the video. Hey folks, fact, theory or mystery in the Legend of Zelda series? We love it around here. Which is exactly why I've created my very own series reviewing your theories and mysteries. An opportunity to move away from going over my own thoughts and putting you lovely folks in the spotlight. Discussing any and all theories and or mysteries that you submit. Welcome back. Episode 8 is here and I've invited a very special guest who I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome to in the comments. Triforce Trends. Hello everyone, I hope you're all having an amazing day and it's a pleasure to be on Mr. Hyrule Gamer's channel itself. Happy to have you on. We've got some super interesting submissions as always to get through, so let's waste no time and hand over that famous line to all guests on the channel, in this case Mr. Trends, and get right into the video. Take it away. Be sure to go and grab yourself a snack or drink and send them in to get featured right here. And also be sure to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. It really helps the channel out and let's get into this one. The first submission we'll be going through today comes from Oryip. They believe that the interlopers, more commonly known as the Twilight, as seen in Twilight Princess, are the same race of people as the Zonai, who have only just had their first appearance by name in the series through Breath of the Wild. Let me preface this submission by saying that this is the only Zonai themed part of the video, I promise. <laughs> Let's start by giving a little bit of background to the interlopers in Twilight Princess. I'd be surprised if you need one if you played the game considering they gave us possibly the single most terrifying cutscene in the entire series, but here goes. The interlopers were a part of Hyrule's and by extension, the world's origin. It's said that the Hylians had an age of peace before word of the sacred realm and its uses got out starting a war across the land. Before long, extremely powerful magic users had figured out a way of properly dominating the sacred realm. These magic users were later named the interlopers of Hyrule, and so the few shadow was created. Wielding great power, it could be used for pure evil if the user intended so. The three light spirits intervened and sealed the interlopers away into the twilight realm, making them the twilight we all know and love today. Do keep in mind that I am a huge fan of Twilight Princess, so I may have some amount of bias in this, but I love the idea of this theory, and I definitely believe that it is plausible. Let's look at the facts. The Zonai are seemingly gone by the time that Breath of the Wild takes place. Their structures lay dormant, derelict, while the rest of Hyrule prospers. From an in-game standpoint, it just makes sense that they would want to expand on this race. They made up a lot of the world's mysteries, and they clearly played a big part of the development of Breath of the Wild in the real world. The Zonai are scattered throughout different pages of creating a champion. And Oryip has a point. Both the Zonai and Twilight were incredibly strong magic wielders, and these Zonai swirls, or whatever you could call them, just do remind me of the Twilight. I don't think I was the only one that started to get Twilight Princess vibes from the first look trailer for Breath of the Wild sequel. However, 
the Twilight had to find a way of getting out from the Twilight Realm for them to be one in the same. Well, I think this can be explained through the pieces of the Mirror of Twilight throughout the map. Some say these are used as a simple easter egg, or just for the quest. But what if, in a game littered with environmental storytelling, the Mirror of Twilight was there to show us that the Twilight did make it back to Hyrule? Maybe they wanted to hint at the only thing that they knew people would be so confused about when it came to the race that never made a real appearance in game. So, what if, after the events of Twilight Princess and Midna's aid to Link, they used the mirror one last time, before being rid of the Twilight Realm for good, this time living peacefully until their race died out? Or did it? Next up, from user Adaptus Lupus, what happens when a hero dies? Now, this isn't like when the player runs out of hearts whilst controlling the hero, no no no. This is in terms of the in-game universe, the lore and gore of Zelda. Story-wise, after the adventure is over and the hero settles down, what happens when he passes on? Well, in one case we actually find out, as you mentioned. In Twilight Princess, we meet the hero Shade, a tall, mysterious knight who teaches us combat techniques throughout the game. Turns out, this is the very same link that we saw in Ocarina of Time. Twilight Princess takes place not too long after Ocarina of Time in terms of the timeline, and the hero that eventually passes away reappears as this spiritual knight, the hero Shade, teaching all of his knowledge to the new hero. It's such an underrated concept. We definitely need to see this again. But we didn't see what happened to him, just that he appears as a shade. You did mention that we saw he was buried in full adornments in Ocarina of Time, but that's about all we know. There isn't really a game in the series where we see this happen, so we'll have to make up a generic situation. So the hero has died. Wherever he lived out his days, perhaps on a farm, or working with the Knights of Hyrule up until death, he is passed on. Jump to whenever that news is known by the Royals, and I am more than certain that they'd hold some sort of grand ceremony to celebrate the life of the knight who saved them all from great danger long ago. Like, you need to remember, this isn't any ordinary person passing on or any average knight. This is literally the saviour of life in this universe. Link more or less single-handedly stops evil from taking over during his life. There would definitely be a big service at Hyrule Castle slash town or wherever this Link grew up to celebrate his life. As for where he'd be buried, that's an interesting question, and the more difficult part to speculate here. You mentioned the idea of there being some sort of tomb or crypt for him, and basically all heroes when they pass on. Well, in my opinion, I don't think that there is any sort of tomb or crypt for the heroes, and let me tell you why. We simply never see evidence of this. Like I said, we've never seen the death of a hero take place in game, but on top of that, we've also never seen references to a dead hero in the form of tombstones, crypts, and tombs. In a series that continues to create references filled and lore building worlds, you'd think we'd maybe see a tomb or crypt if one existed, or at least something to reference it in the past heroes. Obviously I can't say that one doesn't exist, maybe in individual cases a certain hero or two got a tomb made for him, but one designated for all the heroes, like how the royal family have, the evidence points against it, and that's little evidence at that. I really like this question though, and please don't take away my answer as a negative thing, it's just my honest take on this, and I really like questions questions like this. Keep them coming. More obscure mysteries and questions, basically. I think that the hero's death would be recognised with a big service and celebration of his life amongst the people, but after? I'd assume he'd simply just be buried, like everybody else. There is also the scenario where the royal family and people don't know of his death. Perhaps if the hero went on to live more remotely, in that situation, I'd assume his body would be buried wherever he ended up living by the locals. Main point being, sorry, to try and wrap this one up, I personally don't believe that there is a tomb or crypt for the heroes, and that that luxury is more for the royal family, like we see in Ocarina of Time. The hero is simply just buried. That's my take. Oh, and as for the hero Shade, it has been theorised that he potentially died in combat, hence the armour, but there could also be the case that this was a one-off thing, they buried him in these clothes. Armour. I know words. So, for this submission I picked out one that I felt a little sorry for. Don't worry buddy, fourth time certainly was the charm. I'm only sorry it wasn't Mr. Hyrule Gamer himself that picked you. Link's Apprentice believes that the Zelda timeline has been merging for much longer than some people believe. I think when it comes to theories asking the question of when Breath of the Wild takes place in the timeline, 
that there could be a few different answers until it's doubly confirmed after the release of the sequel, but for now I'll take the developers at their word and say that the game takes place at the very end of the Zelda timeline. It's very logical, considering the fact that the game references multiple different events from multiple branches in the timeline and features races from across all of the games. Even in the case of the Rito and Zora, even though it was said that the Zora ended up evolving into the Rito. The point is, things in Breath of the Wild are screwed up, which I've always found funny since Breath of the Wild is the 3D game directly after Skyward Sword, which leaned really heavily into the timeline and gave us direct copies of it printed out. So do I think that the timeline could have been merging way back before Breath of the Wild? To be honest, while the submission does give a lot of evidence here, I think it needs even more evidence to completely solidify it. Though I think the idea is totally possible. You'd hope the timeline wouldn't just merge right before one game, and I don't think that's true either. While there are still a lot of pieces of this theory to iron out, I quite like Arlo's take. He wasn't the first to come up with the idea, but the first to popularise it. The theory he dubbed the recurrence theory. It's the idea that after hundreds of thousands of years, things would start to repeat themselves. As an example, if this battle between the spirit of the hero and Demise's hatred kept going on for years and years, then of course in the child timeline, after Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess and Four Swords Adventures, there would have also been a Great Flood, spawning the Rito, then after the Great Flood subsided years later, we even see this kind of world in spirit tracks, the Rito may have started to regress back into the Zoro, but not fully completing adaptation down to the uses that both races have. From a pure realism perspective, this theory nails it on the head for me. I think, as each branch of the timeline has slowly taken place, the other events also may have happened, meaning that the original statement of the timeline has been merging since Ocarina of Time could definitely be right in many different ways, and while I believe the recurrence theory down to how I personally see the timeline, we can all interpret things in very different ways, and I'd love to see your thoughts on how the timelines merged in the comments. Next up, from user Cretendo, what happened to the magic from the magical rods in Breath of the Wild? So, you've brought up an interesting question regarding weapons in Breath of the Wild, such as the Meteor Rod, the weapons that these dudes use. The description for this item mentions magic, and I quote, a magical rod that can cast three fireballs at once, crafted by an ancient magician. It will break upon running out of magical energy, so make it last. Now, just who was this ancient magician? That's not plural either, implying one person made this. Well, all of these, right? Wow, this is actually a really cool mystery. It's a type of energy that breaks once it's up. The rod itself isn't infused with magic. The entire thing is magic, by the sounds of it. Otherwise, the rod would just end up being drained of magic, right? We don't really meet any magicians or sorcerers in Breath of the Wild, but then again, we don't really meet many people in Breath of the Wild, at least compared to how many we would have met if it was before the Calamity. There is a small chance that this magician could have been around pre-Calamity. We know Hyrule had a lab, who knows what sort of crazy experiments went on there and maybe even got out. Or maybe this magician was around long before all of that. Maybe they're still around and just not within Hyrule. Hmm. Who on earth could this be? Well, your question is actually more aimed at what happened to the magic itself, rather than the magician. Well, if we look at the magic that's no longer present, but we do know of, one candidate comes to mind. You're either going to hate me or love me for this, but it could be the works of a magician who was Zonai. Yep, that's right. We do know that they once were a tribe of magic wielders that left Hyrule long ago. We can't put a date on how old these rods are, but the Zonai could fit the piece to the puzzle, only they appear to have left Hyrule a very long time ago. Would these rods realistically have held up that long? I don't think so. So if not the Zonai behind this magic, who? Well, you could consider the users of these rods, the Wiz robes, whilst being a wordplay on wizard, they could also be considered magicians. I mean, wizards are magic, right? I might actually think that the power hasn't gone anywhere, rather that these wiz robes are the ones making it, potentially even giving it a constant flow of power, which is why it doesn't break when they use it, but when Link takes it, he isn't giving it a constant flow, only what it has left, so when it's out, it breaks. It would also explain why they always have one of these rods, and no one else can see 
seem to come by them. It's not the most solid answer in the world, I know, but it's the best one I've got right now. Maybe we'll learn more about this in the future, who knows. I am very interested to hear all of your guys' thoughts on this one though. It has me bamboozled. Now for our fifth and final submission of the day. From user Jeff Pickard, what if the destruction of the Master Sword releases Fi and Demise, and then Fi inhabits Link's new arm? What a question. This time, both myself and Mr. Trends will be giving our thoughts, you know, as a sort of grand send-off to the submissions. Anyway, the Master Sword, beaten, bruised, and near breaking point. What if it completely breaks at some point and releases the spirit of the Blade Fi, but also the greatest threat to Hyrule, Demise? This is epic. Of course, this is a what-if submission and a very speculative mystery, I guess. My personal thoughts towards this scenario are that I think it would make for a very cool later stage of the game battle. Just imagine that throughout your quest you've been trying to fix this blade up, all for something terrible to happen late on, and it breaks entirely, releasing our longtime friend Fi, but also our worst nightmare. Demise, kicking off a battle for the ages right there and then. Fi helps guide us through the battle by going into her arm. Demise, well, Demise had been recovering within the sealed blade and is at full strength now that he's free. We'd have to find a way to both slow him down, but also repair the blade in order to seal him again. Or put an end to him and his curse once and for all. Kicking off a whole new timeline and backstory for the series going forward. Of course, this is all what if and very very crazy at that, I will admit. But my idea or interpretation of this could be placed wherever in the story. This could happen at the very beginning of the game and Demise could be let free, and with Fi, we repair the blade throughout the game, then seal Demise. Or put an end to him and his curse, like I said. It could be mixed and matched, but generally, that's my crazy thoughts. Let's now hear what Triforce Trends has to say. Oh, oh, okay, now I'm back at home. I'm much more accustomed to speculation pieces, so when we picked this theory out, I simply couldn't wait. Over the course of this series, we've seen many different sets of heroes, Zeldas and Ganons. Whether he be in a pig form, human form, or just chilling as a giant floating pig head as seen in Breath of the Wild. One thing has remained consistent over the course of the timeline though. The Master Sword is one of the strongest swords known to Hyrule at this moment in time. The strongest barring a certain evil god's great sword. Just after Demise drew a curse on Hyrule for ages to come, the hero sealed the spirit of Demise back into the goddess turned Master Sword. To our knowledge, it wouldn't be lifted again until our career of time. Now let's be honest for a minute, timeline wise it would make little sense that Fi or Fi, I'm going to keep calling her Fi from now on, would decide that now was the time to return. The best way I can think of to make sense of why Fi would decide to speak to the hero now is if we truly are ending Demise's curse. Fi didn't think it was time in any of the other games because they knew it wouldn't be the end of the curse. They knew at the current timeline, with those people around Link, they couldn't close off the curse for good. To emphasise just how long that took, they wait until a game that takes place countless years after the other games in the timeline and gives us the return of two characters that have been hinted at over the course of the last three games that have been released thus completing the trilogy and showing us a complete beginning and end to the Zelda timeline in its current state, before a big new bad shows up. Heck, Ganondorf can still show up, just not with the stipulation of being inside of Demise's Curse. Imagine Ganondorf being a friendly Gerudo King, just trying to help you defend Hyrule in the next game. A completely different take on the character that I would honestly quite like to see for a change. Seeing any villain be turned into a good guy is always fun. I especially liked seeing Twin Rover in Majora's Mask doing a complete 180 from their Ocarina of Time counterparts. But anyway, back to the point at hand, so technically, Fi could come back in the next game without a doubt, and considering the sad ending to Fi's story given to us in Skyward Sword, I do believe that it would be a good option from a storytelling perspective. Now could they inhabit Link's arm? Well if the Master Sword is destroyed, then that or the Sheikah Slate will absolutely be the first thing that they would see. If the Sheikah Slate is on hand, personally I think that will be more likely considering the fact that Fi has always felt more like a robot, so seeing them in that form would just make sense. But Fi could absolutely inhabit the arm. Convincing me that Demise could come back is a lot harder for me to believe to be honest, until you realise that the Master Sword has never been canonically broken in these games. It's been powered down to a crazy degree so that the hero has to power it back up, but we've never seen it in this state. Perhaps the spirit of Demise truly is just sitting in the sword, waiting for a true reason to come back. Maybe defeating Ganondorf in the next game is only the beginning of the final battle. 
Defeating the Gerudo King could bring the Master Sword back up to full health, just as Demise awakens. This game's final battle, or even leading into the events of a third game in a trilogy. Either way, it would make for the true final boss fight of the entire series thus far. And that is all we have time for on this episode. If you want to get your own submission featured on next month's episode, then check out my post on the YouTube community tab that will be going live shortly after uploading this video. It'll look a little something like this. All submissions should be left there, and please feel free to copy and paste your submissions from last time if they weren't selected. My mood does change a lot on what I want to cover. Maybe I just didn't want to cover it that time, and maybe I will next time. Please don't feel too bad if they're not selected. I do get a lot of submissions. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and enjoyed having our special guest, Triforce Trends. Thank you all a ton for tuning into this video and I hope that you enjoyed our thoughts on the submissions. Sorry to those that we didn't get to, there were a load that were captivating to read. Over on my channel we made a video that went out at the exact same time as this one, where we both made some concepts for dungeons that we think would make a really cool inclusion in the game that will never release, Breath of the Wild 2. We would really appreciate it if you could go and check out that video down in the description. But again, thank you Mr. Hyrule Gamer Sir for having me on the channel, and I hope I'm back some other time. Please do stay safe guys. It was great having you on, and I definitely recommend that all of you guys check out the video over on his channel, going over some dungeon concepts for in the sequel. His channel reminds me a lot of my own back when I was a similar size, and I'd really, really recommend checking him out. He's a really great creator with a lot of potential. I've linked them below, go check him out. Be sure to drop a wee like down below if you enjoyed, and also consider subscribing for more fabulous Zelda content. Both would make my day. Follow my socials linked below to keep up to date, and as always, a huge, massive, amazing shout out goes to all of my channel supporters. Your support really helps me to make these videos week in, week out, all month long, 365 days a year. If you'd like to join them and get yourself a share upon joining, then consider supporting via the links below. Thanks for watching. I hope you all have an amazing day or night, and until the next time, I've been... Hyrule Gamer.